Hello, everyone. Warm welcome again to Berlinale Talents. Warm welcome to the How Hebel am Ufer. Um, it's been a week of Berlinale Talents everywhere. We said we don't go online, we go everywhere this year, and we traveled the world to many, many, many different places, and we brought that world here together with our talents, together with many, many experts, and of course also with guests coming in from the Berlinale. And I'm particularly proud that we were managing to bring that world also into conversation, so that we exchanged among each other here, uh, dreamt together, and I would even say dream on a little bit further, because uh, in the people, in the connections that we've made, and of course in the films, these dreams can now go on. And uh, we will today bring you someone who is particularly interesting, of course, uh, in the way she's a screenwriter and in the way she's also a director, but also uh, she's someone really interesting to speak about here today and to bridge, in a way, the worlds in between screenwriting and directing, bridging the worlds in between realities and dreaming. And I won't say much more, but I want to introduce you to Anna Sarin, who is here with us, uh, and he will welcome you to our guest, which is Celine Xiama. Celine, thank you for being here. Anas, thank you for being here. Enjoy. Thank you, Florian, and a good evening to everyone at home, wherever you are. Indeed, tonight is a very special uh, conversation with one of France's most prominent filmmakers, Celine Sciamma. Bonsoir, Celine. Bonsoir. Um, Celine, your films are very particular in their construction. They're sort of, as far as I see them, delicate machines where narratives move and these female protagonists that are always present in your filmmaking, whether they be girls or women or even older women, they span the generations and always introduce us into their worlds through, you know, looking, the gaze, desire. These crafted little machines are very special um, constructions. And I think that, for example, Florian mentioned Petite Maman, which you've come to, Berlin, to the Berlinale with, which is your fifth feature, um, is a prime example of that. And I'm very happy that we can talk about it towards the end of the talk, if that suits you, because it's a wonderful gift to the audience. Um, but to start with the beginning of your filmmaking career and perhaps the first three features, they're all in a... So um, just to cite them, uh, Naissance des Pieuvres, Water Lilies, Tomboy and Bande de Filles, um, which are all in a very specific cinematic genre, the coming of age movie. Why do you think you felt so attracted to that genre in particular? Well, I've been answering that question a lot and uh, I'm always trying to answer it differently. Um, mostly also because, you know, it's a path from film to film and of course, even though these three first films are, were built, I mean, they were built in the end as a trilogy, but I had an, each film in mind while, it, while I was doing each film. Um, but uh, I decided to name it a trilogy because I wanted to depart from it in a way. Um, so it's looking back, but trying to answer profoundly from today, I forgot your question. <laughs> what was your well, question? Maybe the best way to what answer it. Me, uh, what attracted me to, the, to this genre? Well, I've always considered that it was a genre, it's a true genre, but I don't know if it's really all told really well as a genre, especially from the French perspective and more, more uh, US perspective or um, why are we, teenagers in French movies and, and, and US movie and teen movies mm. are, 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 not, are not at all portrayed the same way. It's not the same rules. It's not the same culture. And back when I was doing Water Lilies and, and on those three first films, I must say, I was always trying to merge two kinds of tradition. Um, the French one, which is considering um, that looking at adults of children or, or kid isn't about only addressing yourself to kids or or, or teenagers, uh, but it's um, a cinematic genre. It's, it's putting big 
characters on screen. Um, and, um, and the teen movie, much more regarding the US tradition, which is much more of a bubble. Uh, there are no grown-ups, whereas, you know, in France, since uh, Les 400 Coups by François Truffaut, it's also about a kid, like, struggling uh, with the world of adults uh, and trying to escape that world or fit in or... Um, so I always thought, oh, I'm kind of doing this fusion. Yeah. And I used to, to tell it that way, so yeah, I, could, I could easily answer like that, like a blah, blah. I'll take that answer. <laughs> but... <laughs> I'll take that answer. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to begin because I think that is what makes your position in French cinema so interesting, is that you have this Anglo-Saxon tradition that's really present and in terms of, and it's you know aesthetically present but it's also present in terms of the gender politics and we'll get to that but I think as a starting point to say that there's a tension between these two traditions is not wrong and what I think would be fascinating to find out is how you know and so we have this genre of coming of age but I'd be curious to hear about your artistic coming of age so you know what type of films do you remember as a child thinking Oh God, that moved me beyond anything else I've seen. Or what books, because obviously you're, you started your career as a screenwriter and screenwriting is at the center of your filmmaking as well. What books just moved you beyond, you know, to tears in your, in your, little, in your little bedroom, like your characters? Well, it all started with comic books, I must say. Um, and the strong, I mean, the, the the the, Bel the Belgium and French tradition of of the uh, bande dessinée so it's uh, it's either Tintin or uh, Asterix or um, I mean all, yeah those this tradition of the comic book which is called ligne claire clear line which is a, a term that I really like to uh, to use uh, talking to my collaborators uh, you know always trying to find the clear line and it's uh, yeah ligne claire is really linked to this uh, Belgium and French tradition of comic books, it's pretty, it's really linked to, to Hergé. Um, and, um, and, you know, sometimes when I have trouble um, finding an, an, uh, an idea to, for editing, like for instance, in the first scene of Portrait, when the, the, she's in the boat and then uh, the canvas are in, uh, fell into the, um, in the ocean, I was like, oh, how, how, this is such an action scene. How am I gonna do this? you know, in the language of the film, plus it's the first scene, so it shouldn't be like, because there's a stunt woman and everything, so then you're less free. How do we portray this? And, you know, and I'm always thinking, okay, look, what would, you know, tell Tom, how would it be, you know? <laughs> how, how something falls in the water, how do you edit that? So um, that was my first culture. I learned to read, uh, reading, comic books and it's also we can say a fusion between you know literature and image and and already some kind of storyboarding story strong yeah. perspective yeah and addressing a perspective that is already both addressing adults and kids um which is also a kind of fusion that emerged that i'm always trying to do uh where is it's official or secret uh this time it's official um and then i was also uh curated a lot as a kid um, uh, by my father, who was a sci-fi uh, geek. Uh, <laughs> so you grew so up I watching read... Star Trek and Star Wars and other such yes, cultural products? Regarding the film, regarding the film, but I think that was a cultural bath that we were all in. Um, but regarding literature, reading sci-fi when you're an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old starting your uh, career as a reader in novels with Bray Bradbury, or um, uh, it's, uh, it's a strong baptism, <laughs> yeah. uh, science fiction. And then as a teenager, my only revolt, uh, my only rebellion <laughs> against that duration was to actually embrace the French classic of literature, um, Flaubert, uh, Balzac, Zola, and be more, study uh, this literature, um, with passion. St study in, what do you mean by study? Because obviously the three authors that you've cited are 19th century authors that are working in a particular style, naturalism, a lot of ir irony, obviously Flaubert, a lot of attention to detail. So is that, is that really what is happening in your mind? You're looking at the world differently after reading these authors. You're looking 
perhaps with a double edge, maybe even on people around you, in your family, on society. I mean, any reader of Flaubert is immediately a critic of society. So I'm wondering, from an early age, is that already in conjunction with Tintin, something that's happening? Well, I think, you know, I don't know if as a kid or as a teenager, I felt like literature was helping me to look at the world differently. I just think it helped me to figure out the world, really. Um, it was an education. It's also a cultural education that uh, also was to be deconstructed. So that's why I'm very happy that I was uh, given the opportunity to be an early reader, especially of that novel of the 19th century that I think are still feeding my work. Really, I think we're uh, uh, nourishing for some parts of Portrait of Lydia on Fire. And that you, we can say that page 28 is, is a cinematic idea, but it's also very much an idea of a novel of the 19th century. Um, and we could say that Petit Maman has a lot of links with Henry James, for instance, also, which was, um, uh, uh, which is a, a, a recent read uh, in my which, life. Which one in particular, can I ask? Well, all of them, but uh, <laughs> the, um, I mean, I really like the, I don't know what's the title in, in English, but it's the motif dans la tapisserie, which is... Um, the fi the really figure like. in the carpet. Figure in the carpet. And, and, uh, and it was, uh, yeah, a curation given to me by my Italian, very dearest Italian distributor, Gary Razzini, he's a legend. And uh, he told me, oh, I was talking about, to him about writing Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Um, and he was telling me, you should read Henry James. And I did, and I think it gave me, <laughs> um, it gave me, yeah, a lot to think. Um, so, but, so, on, um, so on the one hand, so, yeah, it wasn't about yeah, it wasn't about reading literature and then seeing the world differently. It was actually reading literature and understanding <laughs> the world as it went, actually, yeah. uh, and seeing uh, yeah, understanding the, the, the world better. Uh, also, because from my perspective, being uh, uh, a gay kid <laughs> and uh, knowing very early that I had a, other feelings, other perspective. Um, other points of view uh, around everything in life. <laughs> uh, um, reading. I, mean, I, I was lacking literature that would help me uh, fit in the world. I was, but I was really feeding on literature that would give me the keys of the world, even though I'm not fitting in it, fitting it, fitting in. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know literature does help us interpret the world and figure it out, but perhaps more predominantly, it helps us figure ourselves out. And obviously, as a young gay kid, you're trying to understand perhaps what's gone wrong or why you're different or, you know, why you don't quite fit in. And I wonder, you know, in, in, in these readings, did you, were there particular characters? Because everything that you've cited, these are all male authors, but were there particular ah. characters that emerge from this tapestry of literature that, you know, you thought, oh, there's something here that I've put my finger on, as a queer reader always does, you know, you're always double guessing, double reading. And mm -hmm. here, there's this sort of bubble, and I can feel it, and I'm interested in that, because that's also what your films explore, that ambiguity. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, queer readers are uh, great readers, because uh, sometimes it's just because they share a secret with a, an author or a book that is inside. Sometimes it's just because they are great at reinventing fiction and how it feels. Because it's not about what's in, hidden in a fiction, it's about how you feel about it. Absolutely. So it's not about, is that character a lesbian or is that uh, a romance, uh, that friendship is, uh, is a love story. It's not about finding out, it's not about the clues. I mean, the clues are great. It's great to read a book and find out the clues. But it's most also mostly about how you appropriate thing. Uh, are you how you? It's two different pleasures. It's the pleasure of yeah finding out the secrets and sharing the secrets. And it's also about like how oh, this makes me feel. I don't know. <laughs> mm, this is this is mine somehow, and because I'm gonna I'm gonna play with it. And and I don't know if that's. I don't know if, if I'm really saying something right now. <laughs> um, well, perhaps, I mean, this, perhaps we, I, I'm just trying to sort of imagine what your, you know, the bedroom uh -huh. walls. No, 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 no,
Yeah, I lost my thing. I just wanted to tell you that I never really identify with character and I'm not a character driven person. I, and I know that it's always kind of disappointing when I do Q&A's because everyone is always asking me about how are the characters and like they don't exist. So mostly the secret that I found in book is literature. And, and the, the fire that I found in book is literature. It's not about that character or that plot. And the fire that I found in cinema is cinema, is the fact that cinema exists. Yeah. And the things that are, the books that I love the most, it's the books, it's the books that are celebrating literature. Yeah. And the films that I like the most are the films that are celebrating cinema. Yeah. And that can be either Wall-E or Jean Dillman. Yeah. Uh, but they are celebrating cinema. I, and that's always what I'm, looking for as an audience and what I'm looking for as an artist um, is that when you get out of the room, like when you close a book, you're not in love with that book or that character, you don't connect or identify. I think that's, that's very poor. <laughs> um, you just love literature or you just love cinema. And that's what, that, that's what I was looking for as a reader and as a viewer. I was looking for that feeling of falling in love with art, yeah. really, m more than a more than characters or authors or, you know. Um, but the book... I've, I've been a fan because that's, that's if you ask about how yeah. I was as a kid, yeah. I was a fan, yeah. really. But you were a fan of... I mean, in what you say, what I understand is that it's not so much about the emotional implication with character, but the films or books that produce what you describe are mm -hmm. doing that because they're pushing the boundaries of style within a given medium. And I think that's... I mean, yes, and I mean, I think it's always an opportunity when you don't fit in. As a queer reader or as a queer uh, viewer, I can't really connect with, that, with the characters. They're not designed for me to connect with them. So we have to connect with something higher. Yeah. Either our own imagination facing the opera or um, just the fact that... just to fall in love with somebody's brain also, you know? Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. And um, so we've we've covered we've covered. You know, I'm looking at your bookshelf. I'm looking at this young Celine Sciamma's bedroom, right? So on the bookshelf, I see Tintin, I see Henry James, I see Flaubert, and then on the on the TV playing in this, you know, 1970s, 1980s living room. What are you seeing? Denver, the last dinosaur. <laughs> Nobody knows that. I'm, uh, I'm Tell us about that. Denver. <laughs> I'm seeing, uh, well, I'm a kid of TV. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a kid of uh, VCR. So I'm a kid who records late TV to see films. So at first it's just basically what is on and what is on is, uh, and also I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an elder sister. I have uh, uh, two siblings. Uh, so it's watching TV together and also, um, I mean, I've, uh, I had a very long childhood because I had brothers and sisters. And so I kept watching, uh, you know, what, what we were often as kids. And, uh, you know, in France in the 80s, it was um, the rise of uh, anime uh, in French TV. So uh, all those uh, Japanese anime, uh, even if some of them were designed by French people, actually, well, it was a very strong uh, rise. And we would watch that. And uh, I think it created a whole real generation of otakus. Uh, and uh, um, so we were really we plugged on that culture, uh, TV culture. Um, and, um, and also I began to record TV, yeah, late at night. So much more cine club side uh, to see some oldie movie. And I was also going as a geek to the cine club in my high school. So that's when I got to meet, um, when I started doing my own curation. Um, so you, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know this at all. So you, st you started um, curating a film club, is that right? I was too shy to curate anything. You I just <laughs> went to the club and sat and shut my mouth and watched like uh, Citizen Kane and you know, uh, the third man, and you know, all this, all this thing just, it's just, yeah, this very classic cinephile culture. And also, I was lucky to have a cinephile and still have a cinephile grandmother 
um, who handed me all the American comedy and also a lot of musicals. So it's all Billy about... Wilder, Ginger Rogers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and all the James Stewart movies and Caring Red movie because she was, she was, she was, was an elf. actor lover. She is an actor lover. And, um, and also all the musicals. So I have a, I have a very, very strong culture around musicals. Fred Astaire, mostly. Fred Astaire team. Can you top dance? I, I can because I do. I mean, I, I, everybody can, I, I really can do it very badly. Yeah. But I, I, um, I've tried a lot, obviously. Okay. I've tried a lot for a very long time. You'll show, you'll show us another time if, you're not, if not tonight. <laughs> so, so fantastic. So we have this, there are lots of images obviously in what you're saying and, and I, I can, I'm very curious about your experience in the Cine Club in that you said just now you were quiet and you were, you were listening and I think that doesn't surprise me at all because your characters are always engaged in quiet looking observation at a remove before they ever, you know, put their feet and in, in, you know, their toes into the water. I'm thinking about water lilies here and the main character. They're always in, they're always animated by the need to assess the situation before they plunge into it. And I think that's rather fascinating, but that doesn't mean they're not thinking, right? So I just wonder what you were t thinking in that film club in terms of the films that you were seeing and in terms of perhaps at that early age, the gender politics of these films. Well, I was, uh, I found it all very authoritative and fascinating because it was authoritative in a way. You know, that's what you're looking for when you go to the canon. Yeah. yeah, you're going to, you know. It was mostly about, you know, for me, it was mostly about being serious about cinema. Yeah. Take it very seriously. Yeah. So I would go to the cine club and also I would spend a lot, all my weekends at the, so this is a faux ami, so it's library. Yeah. Libraries, bibliotheque, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would go to the library and when I would I would go like, okay, I'm going to study a contemporary Chinese cinema and the history of Chinese cinema as a 14 year old, you know, and just go then, just read and study and trying to understand, okay, the big six, okay, change career, okay, the politics of cinema also, you know. Being, I mean, I'm, when I'm passionate about something, I, I, I take it very, very seriously. And I think that's what my character do. Yes. Of course, yeah. they're, they're, they might be overthinking, but it's was thinking, they're, they're taking things very, very seriously. And that's maybe what's beautiful about the coming of edge genre. Yeah. yeah. It's the deepness of the perspective, the depth of the perspective. Yeah. And it's, and, and it's the same with kids' perspective. I'm being asked a lot these days, like, oh, what's the kids' perspective? No, it's not the hate of the camera. Yeah. It's not about looking the world from this perspective, which is like a meter and 20 centimeter. I don't know how to say it in inches, you yeah. the math. Yeah. yeah, it's mostly about the fact that their perspective is the fact that they are always in collective, they are always dependent, and they are always connected to what's happening. <laughs> you know, they're looking at their parents wanting to know them very badly, because they've had a whole, whole life before them, mm. and they're so their perspective is being very active, very caring, and taking things very seriously. That's a child's perspective. So it's not about it being cute or having this charm or having this poetic look on the world. It's about taking things very seriously. And I think that's why I was, I've always, you know, trying to work around those characters. It's not because of their age or with their candor or their, it's about, because it's because of their, pe their death, or the, 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 I hope I'm saying this right. <laughs> right. <laughs> of the depth of their, of their, of their perspective. Yeah, maybe, the maybe that's Keith Gates. Maybe that's Keith Gates. Yeah. It's that you, know, you take things very, very at heart. And um, that's why I'm very, you know, that's why, of course, this is a, a trilogy. And then, uh, now I'm going, going back to Kids perspective, but it's just like, trying to have always the deepest perspective. So maybe on family, you should look at a kid because they will give you the deepest perspective on that, you know. Sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so we have this, this notion of perspective, which is obviously central to your plots, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, but just to finish on this arc of, you know, yeah. your artistic coming of age, in terms of seriousness and craft, mm -hmm. in French, I've invariably heard you say, Le cinéma est un métier. Mm -hmm. so, you know, filmmaking is a, is a, is a profession. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And what made you want to make it your profession? Was it, you know, clear from the get go um, that you were you were working towards that, or was was there doubt in between? Was there even a false start into something else? I think um, I'm saying it's a profession because I think it should be taken very seriously, but also because if I I had to make a living, I mean, I had, I had to make a living out of it, doing it. I see it as a profession also because I couldn't picture myself doing it if not as a job. And I don't know what's within that sentence once I said it, yeah. but I said it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying to interpret it on the spot. I know. Let's, all, let's, all, let's all take a moment. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, that notion of, of saying, okay, I'm going to work in film and I'm going, to, I'm going to make it in film somehow. I'll make my way. That leads you to screenwriting. That yeah. leads you to um, that literary aspect of film, which was also, you know, as a screenwriter, you're creating an object, your, your final object is destined to be thrown in a dustbin, right? It's that text that's supposed to disappear. And mm -hmm. it's painful to see that happen and to see other people's, you know, hands on that, on those ideas. Is that perhaps what led you to direct? Or, you know, how did you jump from screenwriting to directing? Did it happen out of desire to a desire to direct or as a matter of fact choice of saying, no, I have to see this idea, you know, professionally to the end and therefore I have to direct. Hmm. Well, you know, it's hard to say because I feel I'm, I mean, I've, from a school perspective, I entered the National Film School um, as a screenwriter and it's a very strict school when you enter as something, even though you're going to go through discovering the whole process of cinema, you should stay where you entered. And, you know, I'm very, I, I stay, I can stay in my, I could at the time. Um, so, but I directed my first film a year after I got out of film school. So I, my job was a director, I became a director right away. Uh, and and so to me, screenwriting has never been. Uh, I I don't connect, and I know it's true. I'm not saying I, I was privileged enough to uh, never feel frustrated yeah. of uh, of uh, working uh, for for a script that was going to be directed for, for somebody else. And that's not because I'm a director, so I, you know I have my moment where I can do my stuff. It's because, as you said, screenwriting is about writing something that will disappear. So it's not about that, what you're going to write. It's about meeting people. And uh, that's about meeting people. And I was lucky enough to work with people that I loved working with. And there was an inherent and, uh, joy for you in the writing process, right? Because any screenwriter yeah. knows that writing is rewriting. And you're living with a text that you know, has multiple lives. Mm -hmm. And that, for you retains its joy that retains i mean it is always for you the center of the filmmaking experience the beginning and its its core or has that shifted i mean i think now i i know about joy every step of the way uh so um, i wouldn't have said that mm. if you asked me a few years ago mm. um because it's quite frankly, but, but I, I, I mean, I've never, I've always been writing. It's the French tradition where we work with, for somebody, yeah. with somebody. Yeah. So it's not about, and, but it, it could take different shape because I like to work, to work alone a lot. So uh, I, I, I tend to work alone and then come back with something and then we talk about it. And that's, that's, that's how I've been working. But it means hours and hours at the table trying to understand somebody. And you know, for me, being a screenwriter, being a director and a screenwriter, I think, and I think when I'm hired by another director, he knows that I'm a director. So it's part of the deal. And, and that deal is that I'm going to look at my, my partner in writing, because, you know, it's, it's not, we're writing together. Um, as a director, I'm going to look at him or her with ambition for him or her as a director. 
So it's not about I have the craft of screenwriting and then you're gonna direct this. It's kind of, it's about really asking the questions about Maisonson and the ambition of the film and trying to you know to to, to, to build a script that will that will um, that will have a and you have a fantasy about the the, the it's the director's fantasy about the film and you have a fantasy about if you want for that director. For for instance, for André Tichiné, I work with around in the film called Being Seventeen. I, it was very accurate about several desires that he had. Um, and I just, I tried to fulfill all his desires for, uh, and, um, he wanted that there would be battles, physical battle scenes, but also a very quiet nature that would be his childhood nature. You know, you're in charge of all that. And it's beautiful to be in charge of all that, I must say. Um, and then, so you, you have that, you're, 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 you're being handed that, and you have to, and it's really playful to try to bring this all desire to, all together. And it's really also really peaceful because it's not about your desires. Um, and also you have your own project for the director. And for instance, I had my own project for André Duchesne, and that was like, I want to look at him as a very young man. I want him to make a very young man film. And I'm not going to tell him, you know, because secrets, secrets. Secret. But um, that's my secret with the film, and my secret with the film is um, is uh, is that I care, and <laughs> I have I have a fantasy for him that is maybe it's not his fantasy. Um, so that's why I don't do screenwriting anymore. Hey, because it takes so much time and so much <laughs> empathy. And yeah. no, but that's why it's always, I, have, I haven't been doing that it, that much, I must say. Yeah. Because this time it's just so deep. You know, one of my projects is with, that has, has been going on for years, because there's also that, that's the film that I released with like directors that you know, but there's also all the work you do. The, the other end of the iceberg, yeah. Exactly, and I've been working, for instance, for 10 years with uh, Jean-Baptiste de Laubier, Parawan, who is the, the, the man behind uh, the, the music in my films, yes, uh, around the film. And, you know, he's been, he's been actually doing it. The film is uh, it's a 10-year work. Wow. And, um, and, it's, uh, and it's, yeah, so it's, there's a lot of, you, 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 there's also things you work around and, and you have yeah, desire for people. And then, it, you know, it happens, sometimes it takes years. Um, so I might be a, a screenwriter, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, in the future, but uh, I haven't been writing for other people now for really, I don't know, four years, yeah. But at the time where you were still at film school, is this the point where you realize that the types of narratives that you want to tell are not in terms of gender, what is being told? Because that isn't easy in the French landscape at all to deal with. Um, oh, no. And I wonder at what point you realized that it's going to be a hard slog. Um, was it in conversation with other students? Was it when you did the film that you realized this? When did that happen, that consciousness? I think it keeps happening. <laughs> I think I'm more, much more aware of that now than at the time. Also because, um, you know, cinema is this very weird art where um, that is based on reproduction. It's the only art where an artist can be really proud of saying, this is like in this. Mm -hmm. Have you seen, uh, you know, uh, you know, a novelist going like, this scene is inspired from the scene from that book, from that guy five years ago. Mm -hmm. So cinema is a culture that is with cannibalism and reproduction. So if you love cinema, you love that. Mm. That's where we are in trouble, mm. right? So at first, you're very submissive with that because you love cinema. Cinema is about reproduction. Cinema is a place where you're proud. Especially as a fan. Sometimes you're proud of parodies. Yeah. Mm. And, that's, and that's the beauty of it. Because even though it's the same lens, it's the same sh shot, it's the same, exactly the same, it doesn't work the same. Mm. So, and it takes a lot of time to uh, stop fetish like, f fetishizing things that you give you that kick. Because that kick 
had a lot of impact in your life. Mm. Because that kick, show you love before you loved, show you sex before you had sex, show you drink coffee in a coffee in Paris before you had a coffee in Paris. So that all those things gave you desire for life. <laughs> And this and maybe is a, that's not your life. Maybe that didn't give you desire for your own life. Mm. You know? But this so is a I think from film to film, I'm really departing from uh, repetition yeah. and fetishizing yeah. and maybe creating my own fetishes. Yeah. And uh, that's for sure. And, uh, and, uh, and in the clips that we'll show in a second, I, I, you know, there's signature elements of Celine Sema, which is, you know, the best possible thing that could happen to a filmmaker. So we'll get to that in a second. But just in terms of reproduction, and this need to not reproduce or to question reproduction. I think for me, now that you know, we have a filmography to look back at together, we have these five films, what is invariably there as a constant, as far as I'm concerned, is that political commitment in terms of the gaze, women's gaze, becomes an aesthetic style, right? So we arrive at this sort of, I'm being very academic here, and, and you, you have to forgive me, but you arrive at this sort of aesthetics of equality. And I think that is, to me, what makes a Celine Siama film stand out and bold, is that you are not so much interested in plots where characters are in vertical relations on top of each other, in conflict, pushing down. What you're actually interested in is this, right? This plane of existence. And so when we enter your movies, like your characters, at a remove, it's sort of to understand where the vertical abyss is. And by the end of it, we make that, you know, you, you walk that line and you arrive at equality and horizontality. And to justify this thesis, <laughs> um, I think it'd be wonderful if you could talk a bit more about your first film, which to me, is a very important film as a, as a filmmaker. I, I'm deeply moved by Water Lilies, which wouldn't translate very well um, into English if we, if we did translate the French title, which is Naissance des Pierres, Birth of the Octopi. It doesn't really, you know, and maybe it takes you back to sci-fi. But um, anyways, Water Lilies was your first um, screenplay uh, that you, you know, ended film school with and your first film. What... What drove you to tell the story of these three female protagonists and synchronized swimming? You know, where did that come from? Well, that's really a personal anecdote. Uh, and um, I went to a synchronized swimming show <laughs> in my town because my friend, my neighbor, I decided to become I mean, practice uh, synchronized swimming, which is, a, you say, a hobby that you don't encounter every, every day. But in my town, I grew up in a, in a new town. Uh, it was built uh, at the beginning of the 70s, and there, were, there was a, a nice rink. So we had this hockey team, one of the best in France. Uh, there was a, a, a baseball team. So, you know, a new town brings a new culture. Um, why am I telling you about my town, except the fact that I'm fascinated by it? Maybe the swimming pool? <laughs> yeah, the synchronized swimming show. So there was also a synchronized swimming team. And my friend, even though she was uh, 14 years old, decided to, to, to begin synchronized swimming. And so she was very brave, and I went to see a show, and, and she, so she was... It's just the scene in the film, you know? It's just, it's just the beginning of the film, it's pretty much... Um, what have been true. And I saw then there was like the, the champions team. And uh, they weren't uh, actually <laughs> balleting on <laughs> Verdi. They were balleting on Cotton Eye Joe. And you're going to have that in your head and I'm going to sing it. And it's a piano, so it's too bad. Go for this it. Is a piano. <laughs> there you see it. I will show you. Um, but still, even though it was Cotton Eye Joe, I was, uh, I was troubled. I was troubled and I was, uh, I felt I had, I had like missed my life. It said like, I was like, yeah, I should have, I'm, I'm too moved by this. I should have done synchronized swimming. So I spent like three years, three years, three days thinking I should have done synchronized swimming. Like how, why do I feel so lame? Why do I feel like I'm missing something in my life? And it's just that I was so impressed by uh, these girls 
uh, I guess, impressed because they were accomplished, impressed because they were a team, impressed because they were just, I mean, carnivalesque uh, femininity. And um, the makeup and the bodices. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I always, I was, I was, I was struck by the fact that this, this is a good, this is a good story idea. You know, this is a good, yeah. When you don't understand what's happening to you, um, but then you take it, you take it, and you take that troubled, yeah, that trouble, right? That you um, that you find in the swimming pool, and you make it into another sort of trouble, mm -hmm. which is the one of desire. And this is where we go back to coming of age, and um, and perhaps we could we could look at a first clip from uh, the end of uh, or near the end of water water lilies, where that question of desire dreams as well surfaces again, and uh, and then we'll talk about that in a second. On se sépare, Marie. Je fais des conneries quand je suis toute seule. Je fais la fête de la piscine après, tu viens Non. Allez, viens. Reste avec moi. Non. Y aller. Il y aura François. Arrête avec tes rêves à la con. Il est avec elle. Ils ont couché hier soir. C'est pas vrai. Si, c'est vrai. Rends-toi ça dans ta petite tête. Et arrête de croire à tes trucs de princesse débile. C'est pas vrai. C'est ça. Il me l'a dit. Genre, il te parle. On a couché ensemble. Il est venu, il a couché avec moi. C'est avec moi qu'il couche. Parce qu'elle, elle veut pas. Mais c'est trop si parce qu'il m'aime un peu. C'est pas grave. Il me reste mon premier baiser. Moi aussi. Moi aussi, tu sais, j'aime quelqu'un. C'est qui Je connais I think <laughs> it's always very moving to see that um, clip. Well, I think um, we have two elements of your style here. We have two girls in bed mm -hmm. talking. We have the first kiss or a kiss. Mm -hmm. And we have dreamers and daydreamers. And they're not kindly treated in your world, at least in this film. Um, it's such a tender moment. and. Um, is, is quite representative of the film itself, but why did, you f why did you feel the need to have these two characters say what they say to each other in that setting? I think this, you know, it's, uh, it's always really crazy for me to watch clips of Water Lilies um, because it's my most conscious gesture and that it, aged pretty well. Superb. Uh, um, and I think it aged pretty well because it's, um, I mean, I see now, you know, when the film was released, uh, the friend character was named Anne, even though she's never named in the film. Um, she's talking about the fact that she slept with this, with this boy. And it's, uh, well, it's, um, She's saying she slept, but you know, it's. I think now we would look at that scene as a rape, 
and um and you know when i think when i thought about the film I mean, you know we are, we are th we're thinking about rape culture we are thinking about all this you know I, 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 we're all thinking about that i mean we're not all but i mean we're all in a way you know <laughs> uh, fighting on different sides we should um, yeah yeah um and I thought, yeah, I was thinking about that, but how how, how can we represent rape? How it has always been represented not as rape? And well, you know, all those kinds of questions. And I was like, oh, but I did. I did represent it, not naming it. And there's another no there's another scene in the film where the per the character played by Adela Nell is, you know, interrupted in her discourse with the main character we've seen in uh, played by uh, um, uh, Adeline Paca by her trainer who says isn't it time for a massage yeah right and then the door closes and we don't know what happens uh, there yeah and at the time i was like oh this is too much You're such well, a busy person with very very dark ideas yeah. and you know uh it's adele and who told me that himself uh, the other day she went uh, to do a screening in high school of water lilies um and um that's what i wanted to tell you there's a scene after the uh, and at the end of the film, after that scene, exactly the scene that you show, when you're when when the boy uh, goes to see uh, Anne's character and says, "I like you," and he actually goes to kiss her, yeah. and she spits in the in his mouth. And at the time, everybody was in the audience in the room. I've been I've been in a lot of rooms with that film. They were screaming, really screaming, going like, Ugh! or laughing, or and now. In that high school where Adele went the other day, they were just clapping, they were just cheering, and um, that's why it aged well. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, and, it's, a good, um, it's a good measure of change. It's yeah. my most radical film, uh, and um, because I had all this, and I, and, and yeah, because I took very, very seriously what was at stake for these teenagers. So it wasn't that I was politically constructed, that I was aware of the power of images. I was just caring a lot, a lot about the three of them. Not one, yeah. not the uh, gawky teenager become, discovering she's a lesbian, uh, and whereas, you know, and, and, and her, the object of all her affection being this, you know, bad girl it's or whatever. It's not duckling. about that. It's not an ugly it's duckling about, narrative, yeah. It's about the three of them. Yeah. And, and Florian's character was very troubling for people at the time, saying, like, what does she want? Like, she's the bad straight girl and everything. No, she's the good straight girl. She's just going by the book. And we've all read this book. And, um, and the fact that the film is showing that, but also commenting on that between the characters and that the whole friendship is built around politics in a way. You know, it's built around desire. That it's also built on politics. Absolutely, and um, and that's um, that's something that amazes me. That's that's you know we're talking to young talents. Uh, like I didn't know at the time. So, follow your guts. <laughs> Just follow that intuition. Your intuitions are political. They are political. They are not your intuitions about what you should do as an image. They're not about your personal stories. Your they're not about, and they're not about the films you love. They're not about that. It, it, you don't lose time. No. Really. They are, your intuitions, I think our intuitions are political. And um, that's why we should follow them. Let's follow them and let's follow what you mentioned in terms of desire. Um, because there's another scene from the same movie, which uh, uh, we, can, we can look at and then comment afterwards. But um, I think it's important to look at now. Quand on y pense, le plafond, c'est sûrement le dernier truc qu'il y aura plein de gens. Au moins 90% des gens qui meurent, tu crois pas C'est sûr. En plus, quand tu meurs, la dernière chose que tu vois, elle reste imprimée dans ton œil. Un peu comme une photo. T'imagines le nombre de personnes qui ont des plafonds dans les yeux Je 
regarderai plus jamais le plafond comme avant. Intuitions are political, Shalin Sama, but so are little gestures, right? Yeah. Desire yeah. there, that's that same bed that you know we'll find um, later on in the film. Uh, and this very tender but very powerful moment of a caress mm -hmm. between two girls. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's nothing more accurate than a caress, the choreography of a caress. You know, we always feel like storyboarding. You know, you have to storyboard violence a lot. But caress is about rhythm and accuracy, being precise, it's beautiful. Um, that those fingers touching, that was like something that was so carefully crafted. Yeah. But the disappointment for me in that scene, I must tell you, <laughs> is that, you know, for me, when she says uh, this thing about the scenings, <laughs> I'm like, I would, for me, she was serious. It was a deep, deep thought, you know? And the first time the film, I mean, was in Cannes, obviously, or you know, the, the screens, but it kept going. In every country, people were laughing at that scene. Mm. They were laughing at that scene. They were, they were amused, but I was taking it so badly. It was like, why are they laughing? At such a deep thought because it's true and it's a thought about death mm. <laughs> it's a very teenager thought but i was a teen i was i was very young it's a it's, but, a, uh, it's a thought about yeah, death. no i know this has also changed i know that you know it, it, it's 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 less of a we're less embarrassed by the fact that a teenage girl could say something that true actually and it's not a but the film was built in a way in a way that yeah it's 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 comedy also becoming, because it's somebody trying to look good, so that's always comedy, right? Uh, and then there's the, the truth of the breathing and, and, uh, and this choreography of, of the caress, which is, which is uh, yeah, also a matrix in my work, yeah. uh, because I enjoy a lot, a lot doing that. Yeah. I think it's, I'm coming to terms and that from, from film to film. How the body talks. And what the body says, yeah, not only the eyes, but the body. And I think, um, I think I actually want to see the last clip that we have tonight, um, which is from Portrait, because uh, that horizont horizontality of desire, that, that political intuition, it's also obviously in this very peculiar film, a beautiful film, where you move away from contemporary France, which was the setting for the first three coming of age movies and you plunge us into an unspecified 18th century yesque France. Mm -hmm. But where these questions of desire and um, truth are reinvigorated with the same actress that you shot with so many years ago, Adela Nell. So maybe we'll look at that last clip and talk about it as well. un nouveau sentiment. Lequel Le regret. Ne regrettez pas. Souvenez-vous. Je me souviendrai de la fois où vous vous êtes endormi dans la cuisine. Je me souviendrai de la fois où vous vous êtes endormi dans la cuisine. 
je me souviendrai de votre regard noir quand je vous ai battu aux cartes. Je me souviendrai de la première fois où vous avez ri. Vous avez mis du temps à être drôle. C'est vrai. J'ai perdu du temps. Moi aussi, j'ai perdu du temps. Je me souviendrai de la première fois où j'ai eu envie de vous embrasser. Quand était-ce Vous n'avez pas vu À la fête, autour du feu. J'en avais envie, oui. Mais ce n'était pas la première fois. Dites-moi. Non, dites-moi. Quand vous m'avez demandé si j'avais déjà aimé, j'ai senti que la réponse était oui. Et que c'était maintenant. Je me souviens. What is beautiful to you, Celine Sema, it seems to me, is when we understand each other. I think that's perhaps the best encapsulation of what your cinema produces uh, in viewers, is to bring us to that moment where the war ends, right? I'm a pacifist, I'm a strong pacifist, I'm all about bridges, so I'm glad you said that. As someone, you know, I know that you are a fan of Kubrick, um, you know, so is any aspiring filmmaker, right? But there is a particular logic to Kubrick that plays on war, as, as the canon does, right? And I think your force, force tranquille presque, your force is that you show us that truth and understanding are inherently beautiful. Um, that the realization of desire is as beautiful as its failures. And this is a constant in your cinema, like a law um, mm. that governs your work. Um, with Petite Maman, we're, I'm, we're nearing a close, so I, I, and I did promise viewers that we would talk about Petite Maman, which is, a, as I said at the beginning, a little gift that operates on another another level, right? It's less perhaps a question of desire th than a question of memory, which is where I chose the, the previous clip. Je me souviens, I remember. But here memory takes on a mechanic of its own, right? It initiates something in the viewer. Perhaps you'd want to tell us a bit more about what exactly brought you to create that little machine. Well, you know, memory, our memories, they are part of our imaginations in a way. Some of my memories from childhood, for instance, are clearly things that I remember. Uh, and some of them are clearly expanded from the photos, from the memories, the official memories of my childhood. So some of them I'm pretty sure I, I, I can see myself in the frame, and some of them I am the character. Um, what if we were building this delicate machine uh, that could make us work on our imagination regarding building our own memories that are as valid as this picture, in a way? That birthday picture where, you know, your ankle has this weird face and you, you know, and that's, that's your six years old, you know. What if... <laughs> You put somebody else in the picture. What if next to you there's somebody who's dead that you want to have next to you at that moment? This power of a brain that we need so much right now because we're locked in. I mean, that forest, which is in Paris, <laughs> which is fake. So we need, we need those kind of impulse, those triggers for this beautiful machine that we are with our brain and our heart. 
And uh, what if, yeah, what if we would create a film that would give us the impulse, uh, the tool, the sensation? Uh, you know, it's like doing your first hypnosis, uh, an hypnosis section, session, you know, for instance. Then you can do it. Then you can, it, it changes the way you focus. It changes the way you, you live a room without living it. It's, it's an experience. So Petite Maman it might be my most uh, ambitious experience regarding how collaborative the view work is and regarding how, how much this time, which is always the project, uh, the viewer is the hero of the film rather than the character being the hero of the film. The character is the hero of the plot. Once more, the character, characters don't exist. That's why you can write about them. That's why you can, you can imagine everything or as much as I can imagine what they're going through, what they went through, you know, um, Could I just maybe, yeah. in terms of that ambition, maybe to specify its nature, to me, mm -hmm. up until now, up until Petite Maman, we were in a naturalist, realist framework within a certain tradition of French filmmaking. I think it's not, you know, uh, any, anything polemic to say. But here, when you say your, your ambition um, extends, it does in a very particular manner in that we begin to dream, actually. So all the characters that we've seen, the female characters that we've seen in bed, thinking, talking, telling the truth, but never really dreaming. Mm -hmm. And with Petite Maman, it's, our, it's really your offering us a dream that becomes very personal. Um, it's a very, very special film, especially now. I think you're absolutely right to say, I know that you started shooting in studio you know, as lockdown was announced in Paris, etc. So it's a film that was in a bubble of its own and that it's, that is, you know, more or less going to be consumed in that same bubble by the yeah. viewer, right? Yeah. And in that, it does um, elicit questions about, uh, without, you know, without disclosing the conceit of the, of the film, it is a mother-daughter story, but of a very particular kind. And it does work like a sort of, you know, a delicate machine, but also a time bomb. It, it, it does um, open up flows into our memory. It in, asks us to delve into parts of our memory and parts of our, you know, relationships with our parents in particular. And that um, perhaps is something that, in terms of the metaphysical aspects in your filmmaking, wasn't the case. So, so where does where did that ambition come from? Why now? Why that? Well, that ambition comes from that idea. <laughs> I mean, uh, I have ambition for ideas. I don't have ambition for myself. I have ambition for ideas that I have when I'm lucky to have ideas. Um, and I was lucky enough to have that one. Uh, and and so then it unfolded a whole new possibility. Of cinema, and that's why I'm most what I'm always looking for. And you've succeeded. Um, um. But every film, you know, it's funny because you know I've been I'm being asked a lot of questions about shooting during lockdown and everything, and I keep saying, yeah, every film is a personal lockdown. But <laughs> if you're having this lockdown within a lockdown, then it's not a lockdown. You're connected, and, it's and that's I think. Um, Celine, I, I know that we have to bring things to a, to a close, but perhaps that's the best way to do it in, in that, you know, everyone who's watching us is in lockdown, but thanks to you, I feel we are all kind of connected through a very particular film and your filmography. So I would like to thank you personally for the opportunity of talking with you. And I'd th like to thank the audience for joining us and uh, wish you. you all a good evening. Thank you.